This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Prologue The Storming of Seringatapam, 1799 Extract from a Family Paper I address these lines, written in India, to my relatives in England. My object is to explain the motive which has induced me to refuse the right hand of friendship to my cousin John Herncastle. The reserve which I have hitherto maintained in this matter has been misinterpreted by members of my family, whose good opinion I cannot consent to forfeit. I request them to suspend their decision until they have read my narrative, and I declare, upon my word of honour, that what I am now about to write is, strictly and literally, the truth. The private difference between my cousin and me took its rise in a great public event in which we were both concerned, the storming of Seringatapam under General Baird on the 4th of May, 1799. In order that the circumstances may be clearly understood, I must revert for a moment to the period before the assault, and to the stories current in our camp of the treasure in jewels and gold stored up in the palace of Seringatapam. One of the wildest of these stories related to a yellow diamond, a famous gem in the native annals of India. The earliest known traditions describe the stone as having been set in the forehead of the four-handed Indian god who typifies the moon. Partly from its peculiar colour, partly from a superstition which represented it as feeling the influence of the deity whom it adorned, and growing and lessening in lustre with the waxing and waning of the moon, it first gained the name by which it continues to be known in India to this day, the name of the Moonstone. A similar superstition was once prevalent, as I have heard, in ancient Greece and Rome, not applying, however, as in India, to a diamond devoted to the service of a god, but to a semi-transparent stone of the inferior order of gems, supposed to be affected by the lunar influences, the moon, in this latter case also, giving the name by which the stone is still known to collectors of our own time. The adventures of the yellow diamond began with the 11th century of the Christian era. At that date, the Mohammedan conqueror, Mahmud of Ghizni, crossed India, seized on the holy city of Somnauth, and stripped of its treasures the famous temple, which had stood for centuries, the shrine of Hindu pilgrimage and the wonder of the Eastern world. Of all the deities worshipped in the temple, the moon god alone escaped the rapacity of the conquering Mohammedans. Preserved by three Brahmins, the inviolate deity, bearing the yellow diamond in its forehead, was removed by night, and was transported to the second of the sacred cities of India, the city of Benares. Here, in a new shrine, in a hall inlaid with precious stones, under a roof supported by pillars of gold, the moon god was set up and worshipped. Here, on the night when the shrine was completed, Vishnu the preserver appeared to the three Brahmins in a dream. The deity breathed the breath of his divinity on the diamond in the forehead of the god, and the Brahmins knelt and hid their faces in their robes. The deity commanded that the moonstone should be watched from that time forth by three priests in turn, night and day, to the end of the generations of men. And the Brahmins heard and bowed before his will. The deity predicted certain disaster to the presumptuous mortal who laid hands on the sacred gem, and to all of his house and name who received it after him. And the Brahmins caused the prophecy to be written over the gates of the shrine in letters of gold. One age followed another, and still, generation after generation, the successors of the three Brahmins watched their priceless moonstone night and day. One age followed another, until the first years of the 18th century saw the reign of Aurangzebe, Emperor of the Mughals. At his command, havoc and rapine were let loose once more among the temples of the worship of Brahma. The shrine of the four-handed god was polluted by the slaughter of the sacred animals. 
the images of the deities were broken in pieces, and the moonstone was seized by an officer of rank in the army of Arangzebe. Powerless to recover their lost treasure by open force, the three guardian priests followed and watched it in disguise. The generations succeeded each other. The warrior who had committed the sacrilege perished miserably. The moonstone passed, carrying its curse with it, from one lawless Mohammedan hand to another, and still, through all chances and changes, the successors of the three guardian priests kept their watch, waiting the day when the will of Vishnu the Preserver should restore to them their sacred gem. Time rolled on from the first to the last years of the eighteenth Christian century. The diamond fell into the possession of Tipu, Sultan of Seringatapam, who caused it to be placed as an ornament in the handle of a dagger, and who commanded it to be kept among the choicest treasures of his armoury. Even then, in the palace of the Sultan himself, the three guardian priests still kept their watch in secret. There were three officers of Tipu's household, strangers to the rest, who had won their master's confidence by conforming, or appearing to conform, to the Muslim faith. And, to those three men, report pointed as the three priests in disguise. So, as told in our camp, ran the fanciful story of the Moonstone. It made no serious impression on any of us, except my cousin, whose love of the marvellous induced him to believe it. On the night before the assault on Seringatapam, he was absurdly angry with me and with others, for treating the whole thing as a fable. A foolish wrangle followed, and Herncastle's unlucky temper got the better of him. He declared, in his boastful way, that we should see the diamond on his finger if the English army took Seringatapam. The sally was saluted by a roar of laughter, and there, as we all thought that night, the thing ended. Let me now take you on to the day of the assault. My cousin and I were separated at the outset. I never saw him when we forded the river, when we planted the English flag in the first breach, when we crossed the ditch beyond, and, fighting every inch of our way, entered the town. It was only at dusk when the place was ours, and after General Baird himself had found the dead body of Tipu under a heap of the slain, that Herncastle and I met. We were each attached to a party sent out by the General's orders to prevent the plunder and confusion which followed our conquest. The camp followers committed deplorable excesses, and, worse still, the soldiers found their way, by a guarded door, into the treasury of the palace, and loaded themselves with gold and jewels. It was in the court outside the treasury that my cousin and I met to enforce the laws of discipline on our own soldiers. Herncastle's fiery temper had been, as I could plainly see, exasperated to a kind of frenzy by the terrible slaughter through which we had passed. He was very unfit, in my opinion, to perform the duty that had been entrusted to him. There was riot and confusion enough in the treasury, but no violence that I saw. The men, if I may use such an expression, disgraced themselves good-humouredly. All sorts of rough jests and catchwords were banded about among them, and the story of the diamond turned up again unexpectedly in the form of a mischievous joke. "'Who's got the moonstone?' was the rallying cry which perpetually caused the plundering, as soon as it was stopped in one place, to break out in another. While I was still vainly trying to establish order, I heard a frightful yelling on the other side of the courtyard, and at once ran towards the cries, in dread of finding some new outbreak of the pillage in that direction. I got to an open door, and saw the bodies of two Indians, by their dress I guessed officers of the palace, lying across the entrance dead. A cry inside hurried me into a room which appeared to serve as an armoury. A third Indian, mortally wounded, was sinking at the feet of a man whose back was towards me. The man turned at the instant when I came in, and I saw John Herncastle with a torch in one hand and a dagger dripping with blood in the other. 
A stone, set like a pommel in the end of the dagger's handle, flashed in the torchlight as he turned on me, like a gleam of fire. The dying Indian sank to his knees, pointed to the dagger in Herncastle's hand, and said in his native language, The moonstone will have its vengeance yet on you and yours. He spoke those words, and fell dead on the floor. Before I could stir in the matter, the men who had followed me across the courtyard crowded in. My cousin rushed to meet them like a madman. Clear the room, he shouted to me, and set a guard on the door. The men fell back as he threw himself on them with his torch and his dagger. I put two sentinels of my own company, on whom I could rely, to keep the door. Through the remainder of the night I saw no more of my cousin. Early in the morning, the plunder still going on, General Baird announced publicly, by beat of drum, that any thief detected in the fact, be he whom he might, should be hung. The provost marshal was in attendance to prove that the general was in earnest, and in the throng that followed the proclamation, Herncastle and I met again. He held out his hand to me as usual, and said, Good morning. I waited before I gave him my hand in return. Tell me first, I said, how the Indian in the armoury met his death, and what those last words meant when he pointed to the dagger in your hand. The Indian met his death, as I suppose, by a mortal wound, said Herncastle. What his last words mean, I know no more than you do. I looked at him narrowly. His frenzy of the previous day had all calmed down. I determined to give him another chance. Is that all you have to tell me? I asked. He answered, That is all. I turned my back on him, and we have not spoken since. I beg it to be understood that what I write here about my cousin, unless some necessity should arise for making it public, is for the information of the family only. Herncastle has said nothing that can justify me in speaking to our commanding officer. He has been taunted more than once about the diamond by those who recollect his angry outbreak before the assault. But, as may easily be imagined, his own remembrance of the circumstances under which I surprised him in the armoury has been enough to keep him silent. It is reported that he means to exchange into another regiment, avowedly for the purpose of separating himself from me. Whether this be true or not, I cannot prevail upon myself to become his accuser, and I think with good reason. If I made the matter public, I have no evidence but moral evidence to bring forward. I have not only no proof that he killed the two men at the door, I cannot even declare that he killed the third man inside, for I cannot say that my own eyes saw the deed committed. It is true that I heard the dying Indian's words, but if those words were pronounced to be the ravings of delirium, how could I contradict this assertion from my own knowledge? Let our relatives on either side form their own opinion of what I have written, and decide for themselves whether the aversion which I now feel towards this man is well or ill-founded. Although I attach no sort of credit to the fantastic Indian legend of the gem, I must acknowledge, before I conclude, that I am influenced by a certain superstition of my own in this matter. It is my conviction, or my delusion, no matter which, that crime brings its own fatality with it. I am not only persuaded of Herncastle's guilt, I am even fanciful enough to believe that he will live to regret it, if he keeps the diamond, and that others will live to regret taking it from him, if he gives the diamond away. End of prologue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Chapter 1 The Story First Period The Loss of the Diamond, 1848 Events related by Gabriel Betteridge, house steward in the service of Julia, Lady Verinder. 
Chapter 1 In the first part of Robinson Crusoe, at page 129, you will find it thus written. Now I saw, though too late, the folly of beginning a work before we count the cost, and before we judge rightly of our own strength to go through with it. Only yesterday I opened my Robinson Crusoe at that place. Only this morning, May 21st, 1850, came my lady's nephew, Mr. Franklin Blake, and held a short conversation with me as follows. Betteridge, says Mr. Franklin, I have been to the lawyers about some family matters, and, among other things, we have been talking of the loss of the Indian diamond in my aunt's house in Yorkshire two years since. Mr. Bruff thinks, as I think, that the whole story ought, in the interest of truth, to be placed on record in writing, and the sooner the better. Not perceiving his drift yet, and thinking it always desirable for the sake of peace and quietness to be on the lawyer's side, I said I thought so too. Mr. Franklin went on. In this matter of the diamond, he said, the characters of innocent people have suffered under suspicion already, as you know. The memories of innocent people may suffer hereafter for want of a record of the facts to which those who come after us can appeal. There can be no doubt that this strange family story of ours ought to be told. And I think, Betteridge, Mr. Bruff and I together have hit on the right way of telling it. Very satisfactory to both of them, no doubt, but I failed to see what I myself had to do with this so far. We have certain events to relate, Mr. Franklin proceeded, and we have certain persons concerned in those events who are capable of relating them. Starting from these plain facts, the idea is that we should all write the story of the Moonstone in turn, as far as our own personal experience extends, and no further. We must begin by showing how the diamond first fell into the hands of my uncle Herncastle, when he was serving in India fifty years since. This prefatory narrative I have already got by me in the form of an old family paper, which relates the necessary particulars on the authority of an eyewitness. The next thing to do is to tell how the diamond found its way into my aunt's house in Yorkshire two years ago, and how it came to be lost in little more than twelve hours afterwards. Nobody knows as much as you do, Betteridge, about what went on in the house at that time, so you must take the pen in hand and start the story. In those terms I was informed of what my personal concern was with the matter of the diamond. If you are curious to know what course I took under the circumstances, I beg to inform you that I did what you would probably have done in my place. I modestly declared myself to be quite unequal to the task imposed upon me, and I privately felt, all the time, that I was quite clever enough to perform it, if I only gave my own abilities a fair chance. Mr. Franklin, I imagine, must have seen my private sentiments in my face. He declined to believe in my modesty, and he insisted on giving my abilities a fair chance. Two hours have passed since Mr. Franklin left me. As soon as his back was turned, I went to my writing desk to start the story. There I have sat helpless, in spite of my abilities, ever since. Seeing what Robinson Crusoe saw, as quoted above, namely the folly of beginning a work before we count the cost, and before we judge rightly of our own strength to go through with it. Please to remember I opened that book by accident at that pit only the day before I rashly undertook the business now in hand. And allow me to ask, if that isn't prophecy, what is? I am not superstitious. I have read a heap of books in my time. I am a scholar in my own way. Although turned seventy, I possess an active memory and legs to correspond. You are not to take it, if you please, as a saying of an ignorant man, when I express my opinion that a book such as Robinson Crusoe never was written and never will be written again. I have tried that book for years, generally in combination with a pipe of tobacco, and I have found it my friend in need in all the necessities of this mortal life. When my spirits are bad, Robinson Crusoe. When I want advice, Robinson Crusoe. 
in past times when my wife plagued me, in present times when I have had a drop too much, Robinson Crusoe. I have worn out six stout Robinson Crusoes with hard work in my service. On my lady's last birthday she gave me a seventh. I took a drop too much on the strength of it, and Robinson Crusoe put me right again. Price four shillings and sixpence, bound in blue, and with a picture into the bargain. Still, this doesn't look much like starting the story of the diamond, does it? I seem to be wandering off in search of Lord knows what, Lord knows where. We will take a new sheet of paper, if you please, and begin all over again, with my best respects to you. End of chapter 1 LibriVox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Chapter 2 I spoke of my lady a line or two back. Now the diamond could never have been in our house, where it was lost, if it had not been made a present of to my lady's daughter. And my lady's daughter would never have been in existence to have the present, if it had not been for my lady, who, with pain and travail, produced her into the world. Consequently, if we begin with my lady, we are pretty sure of beginning far enough back. And that, let me tell you, when you've got such a job as mine in hand, is a real comfort at starting. If you know anything of the fashionable world, you have heard tell of the three beautiful Miss Herncastles, Miss Adelaide, Miss Caroline, and Miss Julia, the last being the youngest and best of the three sisters, in my opinion. And I had opportunities of judging, as you shall presently see. I went into the service of the old lord, their father, Thank God we got nothing to do with him in this business of the diamond. He had the longest tongue and the shortest temper of any man, high or low, I ever met with. I say, I went into the service of the old lord as page-boy in waiting on the three honourable young ladies at the age of fifteen years. There I lived till Miss Julia married the late Sir John Verinder, an excellent man who only wanted somebody to manage him, and between ourselves he found somebody to do it and, what is more, he throve on it, and grew fat on it, and lived happy, and died easy on it, dating from the day when my lady took him in church to be married, to the day when she relieved him of his last breath, and closed his eyes for ever. I have omitted to state that I went with the bride, to the bride's husband's house and lands down here. Sir John, she says, I cannot do without Gabriel Betteridge. My lady, says Sir John, I can't do without him either. That was his way with her, and that was how I went into his service. It was all one to me where I went, so long as my mistress and I were together. Seeing that my lady took an interest in the out-of-door work and the farms and such like, I took an interest in them too, with all the more reason that I was a small farmer's seventh son myself. My lady got me put under the bailiff, and I did my best, and gave satisfaction and got promotion accordingly. Some years later, on the Monday, as it might be, my lady says, Sir John, your bailiff is a stupid old man. Pension him liberally, and let Gabriel Betteridge have his place. On the Tuesday, as it might be, Sir John says, My lady, the bailiff is pensioned liberally, and Gabriel Betteridge has got his place. You hear more than enough of married people living together miserably. Here is an example to the contrary. Let it be a warning to some of you, and an encouragement to others. In the meantime, I will go on with my story. Well, there I was in Clover, you will say, placed in a, in a position of trust and honour, with a little cottage of my own to live in, with my rounds on the estate to occupy me in the morning, and my accounts in the afternoon, and my pipe and my Robinson Crusoe in the evening. What more could I possibly want to make me happy? Remember what Adam wanted when he was alone in the Garden of Eden, and if you don't blame it in Adam, don't blame it in me. The woman I fixed my eye on was the woman who kept house for me at my cottage. Her name was Selina Gobi. I agree with the late William Cobbett about picking a wife. See that he chews her food well, and sets her foot down firmly on the ground when she walks, and you're all right. Selina Gobi was all right in both of these respects, 
which was one reason for marrying her. I had another reason, likewise, entirely of my own discovering. Selina, being a single woman, made me pay so much a week for her board and services. Selina, being my wife, couldn't charge for her board, and would have to give me her services for nothing. That was the point of view I looked at it from. Economy, with a dash of love. I put it to my mistress, as in duty bound, just as I put it to myself. I have been turning Selina Gobi over in my mind, I said, and I think, my lady, it will be cheaper to marry her than to keep her. My lady burst out laughing, and said she didn't know which to be most shocked at, my language or my principles. Some joke tickled her, I suppose, of the sort you can't take unless you are a person of quality. Understanding nothing myself, but that I was free to put it next to Selina, I went and put it accordingly. And what did Selina say? Lord, how little you must know of women if you have to ask that. Of course, she said yes. As my time drew nearer, and there got to be talk of my having a new coat for the ceremony, my mind began to misgive me. I have compared notes with other men as to what they have felt while they were in my interesting situation, and they have all acknowledged that, about a week before it happened, they privately wished themselves out of it. I went a trifle further than that myself. I actually rose up, as it were, and tried to get out of it not for nothing. I was too just a man to expect that she would let me off for nothing. Compensation to the woman when the man gets out of it is one of the laws of England. In obedience to the laws, and after turning it over carefully in my mind, I offered Selina Gobi a feather bed and fifty shillings to be off the bargain. You will hardly believe it, but it is nevertheless true that she was fool enough to refuse. After that it was all over with me, of course. I got the new coat as cheap as I could, and I went through with all the rest of it as cheap as I could. We were not a happy couple, and not a miserable couple. We were six of one, and half a dozen of the other. How it was I don't understand, but we always seemed to be getting, with the best of motives, in each other's way. When I wanted to go upstairs, there was my wife coming down. Or when my wife wanted to go down, there was I coming up. That is married life, according to my experience of it. After five years of misunderstandings on the stairs, it pleased an all-wise providence to relieve us of each other by taking my wife. I was left with my little girl, Penelope, and with no other child. Shortly afterwards, Sir John died, and my lady was left with her little girl, Miss Rachel, and no other child. I have written to very poor purpose of my lady, if you require to be told that my little Penelope was taken care of, under my good mistress's own eye, and was sent to school and taught and made a sharp girl, and promoted when old enough to be Miss Rachel's own maid. As for me, I went on with my business as bailiff year after year, up to Christmas 1847, when there came a change in my life. On that day my lady invited herself to a cup of tea alone with me in my cottage. She remarked that, reckoning from the year when I started as a page-boy, in the time of the old lord, I had been more than fifty years in her service, and she put into my hands a beautiful waistcoat of wool that she had worked herself, to keep me warm in the bitter winter weather. I received this magnificent present, quite at a loss to find the words to thank my mistress with, for the honour she had done me. To my great astonishment, as it turned out, however, that the waistcoat was not an honour, but a bribe. My lady had discovered that I was getting old, before I had discovered it myself, and she had come to my cottage to wheedle me, if I may use such an expression, into giving up my hard out-of-door work as a bailiff, and taking my ease for the rest of my days as steward in the house. I made as good a fight of it against the indignity of taking my ease as I could, but my mistress knew the weak side of me. She put it as a favour to herself. The dispute between us ended, after that, in my wiping my eyes like an old fool with my new woollen waistcoat, and saying I would think about it. The perturbation in my mind, in regard to thinking about it, being truly dreadful after my lady had gone away, 
I apply the remedy which I have never yet found to fail me in cases of doubt and emergency. I smoked a pipe and took a turn at Robinson Crusoe. Before I had occupied myself with that extraordinary book five minutes, I came on a comforting bit, page 158, as follows. Today we love what tomorrow we hate. I saw my way clear directly. Today I was all for continuing to be farm bailiff. Tomorrow, on the authority of Robinson Crusoe, I should be all the other way. Take myself tomorrow while in tomorrow's humour, and the thing was done. My mind being relieved in this matter, I went to sleep that night in the character of Lady Verinder's farm bailiff, and I awoke the next morning in the character of Lady Verinder's house steward. All quite comfortable, and all through Robinson Crusoe. My daughter Penelope has just looked over my shoulder to see what I have done so far. She remarks that it is beautifully written, and every word of it true, but she points out one objection. She says that what I have done so far isn't in the least what I was wanted to do. I am asked to tell the story of the diamond, and, instead of that, I have been telling the story of my own self. Curious, and quite beyond me to account for. I wonder whether gentlemen who make a business and a living out of writing books ever find their own selves getting in the way of their subjects like me. If they do, I can feel for them. In the meantime, here is another full start and more waste of good writing paper. What's to be done now? Nothing that I know of, except for you to keep your temper and for me to begin all over again for the third time. End of chapter 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Chapter 3 The question of how I am to start the story properly I have tried to settle in two ways. First, by scratching my head, which has led to nothing. Second, by consulting my daughter Penelope, which has resulted in an entirely new idea. Penelope's notion is that I should set down what happened regularly, day by day, beginning with the day when we first got the news that Mr. Franklin Blake was expected on a visit to the house. When you come to fix your memory with a date in this way, it is wonderful what your memory will pick up for you upon that compulsion. The only difficulty is to fetch out the dates in the first place. This Penelope offers to do for me by looking into her own diary, which she was taught to keep when she was at school, and which she has gone on keeping ever since. In answer to an improvement on this notion, devised by myself, namely that she should tell the story instead of me, out of her own diary, Penelope observes, with a fierce look and a red face, that her journal is for her own private eye, and that no living creature shall ever know what is in it but herself. When I inquire what this means, Penelope says fiddlesticks. I say sweethearts. Beginning then on Penelope's plan, I beg to mention that I was specially called one Wednesday morning into my lady's own sitting room, the date being the 24th of May, 1848. Gabriel, says my lady, here is news that will surprise you. Franklin Blake has come back from abroad. He has been staying with his father in London, and he is coming to us tomorrow to stop till next month and keep Rachel's birthday. If I had had a hat in my hand, nothing but respect would have prevented me from throwing that hat up to the ceiling. I had not seen Mr. Franklin since he was a boy, living along with us in this house. He was, out of all sight, as I remember him, the nicest boy that ever spun a top or broke a window. Miss Rachel, who was present, and to whom I made that remark, observed in return that she remembered him as the most atrocious tyrant that ever tortured a doll, and the hardest driver of an exhausted little girl in string harness that England could produce. "'I burn with indignation, and I ache with fatigue,' was the way Miss Rachel summed it up, when I think of Franklin Blake. Hearing now what I tell you, you will naturally ask how it was that Mr. Franklin should have passed all the years, from the time when he was a boy to the time when he was a man, out of his own country. I answer, 
because his father had the misfortune to be next heir to a dukedom and not be able to prove it. In two words, this was how the thing happened. My lady's eldest sister married the celebrated Mr. Blake, equally famous for his great riches and his great suit at law. How many years he went on worrying the tribunals of his country to turn out the duke in possession and put himself in the duke's place, how many lawyers' purses he filled to bursting, and how many otherwise harmless people he set by the ears together disputing whether he was right or wrong, is more by a great deal than I can reckon up. His wife died, and two of his three children died, before the tribunals could make up their minds to show him the door and take no more of his money. When it was all over, and the Duke in possession was left in possession, Mr. Blake discovered that the only way of being even with his country, for the manner in which it had treated him, was not to let his country have the honour of educating his son. How can I trust my native institutions, was the form in which he put it, after the way in which my native institutions have behaved to me? Add to this that Mr. Blake disliked all boys, his own included, and you will admit that it could only end in one way. Master Franklin was taken from us in England, and he was sent to institutions which his father could trust, in that superior country, Germany. Mr. Blake himself, you will observe, remaining snug in England to improve his fellow countrymen in the Parliament House, and to publish a statement on the subject of the Duke in possession, which has remained an unfinished document from that day to this. There, thank God that's told. Now, neither you nor I need trouble our heads any more about Mr. Blake Sr., leave him to the dukedom, and lets you and I stick to the diamond. The diamond takes us back to Mr. Franklin, who was the innocent means of bringing that unlucky jewel into the house. Our nice boy didn't forget us after he went abroad. He wrote every now and then, sometimes to my lady, sometimes to Miss Rachel, and sometimes to me. We had a transaction together before he left, which consisted in his borrowing of me a ball of string, a four-bladed knife, and seven and sixpence in money the colour of which last I have not seen, and never expect to see again. His letters to me chiefly related to borrowing more. I heard, however, from my lady, how he got on abroad, as he grew in years and stature. After he had learnt what the institutions of Germany could teach him, he gave the French a turn next, and the Italians a turn after that. They made him, among them, a sort of universal genius, as well as I could understand it. He wrote a little, he painted a little, he sang and played and composed a little, borrowing, as I suspect, in all these cases, just as he had borrowed from me. His mother's fortune, seven hundred a year, fell to him when he came of age, and ran through him as it might through a sieve. The more money he had, the more he wanted. There was a hole in Mr. Franklin's pocket that nothing would sew up. Wherever he went, the lively, easy way of him made him welcome. He lived here, there, and everywhere, his address, as he used to put it himself, being Post Office Europe, to be left till called for. Twice over he made up his mind to come back to England and see us, and twice over, saving your presence, some unmentionable woman stood in the way and stopped him. His third attempt succeeded, as you know already from what my lady told me. On Thursday the 25th of May we were to see for the first time what our nice boy had grown up to be as a man. He came of good blood, had high courage, and he was five and twenty years of age by our reckoning. Now you know as much of Mr. Blake as I did, before Mr. Franklin Blake came down to our house. The Thursday was as fine a summer's day as ever you saw, and my lady and Miss Rachel, not expecting Mr. Franklin till dinner time, drove out to lunch with some friends in the neighbourhood. When they were gone, I went and had a look at the bedroom which had been got ready for our guest and saw that all was straight. Then, being butler in my lady's establishment as well as steward, at my own particular request, mind, and because it vexed me to see anybody but myself in possession of the key to the late Sir John's cellar, then, as I say, I fetched up some of our famous Latour claret, and set it in the warm summer air to take the chill off before dinner. Concluding to set myself in the warm summer air next, seeing that what is good for claret is equally good for old age, I took up my beehive chair to go out to the back court, when I was stopped by hearing a sound like the soft beating of a drum on the terrace in front of my lady's residence. Going round to the terrace, I found three mahogany-coloured Indians, in white linen frocks and trousers, 
looking up at the house. The Indians, as I saw on looking closer, had small hand drums slung in front of them. Behind them stood a little, delicate-looking, light-haired English boy carrying a bag. I judged the fellows to be strolling conjurers, and the boy with the bag to be carrying the tools of their trade. One of the three, who spoke English, and who exhibited, I must own, the most elegant manners, presently informed me that my judgment was right. He requested permission to show his tricks in the presence of the lady of the house. Now, I am not a sour old man. I am generally all for amusement, and the last person in the world to distrust another person because he happens to be a few shades darker than myself. But the best of us have our weaknesses, and my weakness, when I know a family plate basket to be out on the pantry table, is to be instantly reminded of that basket by the sight of a strolling stranger whose manners are superior to my own. I accordingly informed the Indian that the lady of the house was out, and I warned him and his party off the premises. He made me a beautiful bow in return, and he and his party went off the premises. On my side, I returned to my beehive chair, and set myself down on the sunny side of the court, and fell, if the truth must be owned, not exactly into a sleep, but into the next best thing to it. I was roused by my daughter Penelope, running out at me as if the house was on fire. What do you think she wanted? She wanted to have the three Indian jugglers instantly taken up, for this reason, namely that they knew who was coming from London to visit us, and that they meant some mischief to Mr. Franklin Blake. Mr. Franklin's name roused me. I opened my eyes and made my girl explain herself. It appeared that Penelope had just come from my lodge, where she had been having a gossip with the lodgekeeper's daughter, the two girls had seen the Indians pass out after I had worn them off, followed by their little boy. Taking it into their heads that the boy was ill-used by the foreigners, for no reason that I could discover, except that he was pretty and delicate-looking, the two girls had stolen along the inner side of the hedge between us and the road, and had watched the proceedings of the foreigners on the other side. Those proceedings resulted in the performance of the following extraordinary tricks. They first looked up the road and down the road, and made sure that they were alone. Then they all three faced about and stared hard in the direction of our house. Then they jabbered and disputed in their own language, and looked at each other like men in doubt. Then they all turned to the little English boy, as if they expected him to help them. And then the chief Indian, who spoke English, said to the boy, Hold out your hand. On hearing those dreadful words, my daughter Penelope said she didn't know what prevented her heart from flying straight out of her. I thought privately it might have been her stays. All I said, however, was, You make my flesh creep. Nota bene, women like these little compliments. Well, when the Indian said, Hold out your hand, the boy shrank back and shook his head and said he didn't like it. The Indian, thereupon, asked him, not at all unkindly, whether he would like to be sent back to London, and left where they had found him, sleeping in an empty basket in a market, a hungry, ragged and forsaken little boy. This, it seems, ended the difficulty. The little chap unwillingly held out his hand. Upon that, the Indian took a bottle from his bosom, and poured out of it some black stuff, like ink, into the palm of the boy's hand. The Indian, first touching the boy's head, and making signs over it in the air, then said, Look. The boy became quite stiff, and stood like a statue, looking into the ink in the palm of his hand. So far, it seemed to me, to be juggling, accompanied by a foolish waste of ink. I was beginning to feel sleepy again, when Penelope's next words stirred me up. The Indians looked up the road and down the road once more, and then the chief Indian said these words to the boy. See the English gentleman from foreign parts. The boy said, I see him. The Indian said, Is it on the road to this house, and on no other, that the English gentleman will travel today? The boy said, It is on the road to this house, and on no other, 
that the English gentleman will travel today. The Indian put a second question, after waiting a little first. He said, Has the English gentleman got it about him? The boy answered, also after waiting a little first. Yes. The Indian put a third and last question. Will the English gentleman come here, as he has promised to come, at the close of the day? The boy said, I can't tell. The Indian asked why. The boy said, I am tired. The mist rises in my head and puzzles me. I can see no more today. With that the catechism ended. The chief Indian said something in his own language to the other two, pointing to the boy, and pointing towards the town, in which, as we afterwards discovered, they were lodged. He then, after making more signs on the boy's head, blew on his forehead, and so woke him up with a start. After that they all went on their way towards the town, and the girl saw them no more. Most things, they say, have a moral, if only you look for it. What was the moral of this? The moral was, as I thought, first, that the chief juggler had heard Mr. Franklin's arrival talked of among the servants out of doors, and saw his way to making a little money by it. Second, that he and his men and boy, with a view to making the said money, meant to hang about until they saw my lady drive home, and then come back and foretell Mr. Franklin's arrival by magic. Third, that Penelope had heard them rehearsing their hocus-pocus, like actors rehearsing a play. Fourth, that I should do well to have an eye that evening on the plate-basket. Fifth, that Penelope would do well to cool down and leave me, her father, to doze off again in the sun. That appeared to me to be the sensible view. If you know anything of the ways of young women, you won't be surprised to hear that Penelope wouldn't take it. The moral of the thing was serious, according to my daughter. She particularly reminded me of the Indian's third question. Has the Englishman got it about him? Oh, father, says Penelope, clasping her hands, don't joke about this. What does it mean? We'll ask Mr. Franklin, my dear, I said, if you can wait till Mr. Franklin comes. I winked to show that I meant that in joke. Penelope took it quite seriously. My girl's earnestness quite tickled me. What on earth should Mr. Franklin know about it? I inquired. Ask him, says Penelope, and see whether he thinks it's a laughing matter too. With that parting shot, my daughter left me. I settled it with myself when she was gone, that I really would ask Mr. Franklin, mainly to set Penelope's mind at rest. What was said between us, when I did ask him, later on, the same day, you will find set out fully in its proper place. But as I don't wish to raise your expectations and then disappoint them, I, t I will take leave to warn you here, before we go any further, that you won't find the ghost of a joke in our conversation on the subject of the jugglers. To my great surprise, Mr. Franklin, like Penelope, took the thing very seriously. How seriously, you will understand, when I tell you that, in his opinion, it meant the moonstone. End of chapter 3 Recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Chapter 4 I am truly sorry to detain you over me and my beehive chair. A sleepy old man in a sunny backyard is not an interesting object, I am well aware. But things must be put down in their places, as things actually happened, and you must please to jog on in a little while longer with me, in expectation of Mr. Franklin Blake's arrival later in the day. Before I had time to doze off again, after my daughter Penelope had left me, I was disturbed by a rattling of plates and dishes in the servants' hall, which meant that dinner was ready. Taking my own meals in my own sitting-room, I had nothing to do with the servant's dinner, except to wish them a good stomach to it all round, previous to composing myself once more in my chair. I was just stretching my legs when out bounced another woman on me. Not my daughter again, 
Only Nancy, the kitchen maid, this time. I was straight in her way out, and I observed, as she asked me to let her by, that she had a sulky face, a thing which, as head of the servants, I never allow, on principle, to pass me without inquiry. "'What are you turning your back on your dinner for?' I asked. "'What's wrong now, Nancy?' Nancy tried to push by without answering, upon which I rose up and took her by the ear. She is a nice, plump young lass, and it is customary with me to adopt that manner of showing that I personally approve of a girl. "'What's wrong now?' I said once more. "'Rosanna's late again for dinner,' says Nancy, "'and I'm sent to fetch her in. "'All the hard work falls on my shoulders in this house. "'Let me alone, Mr. Betteridge.' The person here mentioned as Rosanna was our second housemaid. Having a kind of pity for our second housemaid, why, you shall presently know, and seeing in Nancy's face that she would fetch her fellow-servant in with more hard words than might be needful under the circumstances, it struck me that I had nothing in particular to do, and that I might as well fetch Rosanna myself, giving her a hint to be punctual in future, which I knew she would take kindly from me. "'Where is Rosanna?' I inquired. "'At the sands, of course,' said Nancy, with a toss of her head. "'She had another of her fainting fits this morning, "'and she asked to go out and get a breath of fresh air. "'I have no patience with her.' "'You go back to your dinner, my girl,' I said. "'I have patience with her, and I'll fetch her in.' "'Nancy, who has a fine appetite, looked pleased.' When she looks pleased, she looks nice. When she looks nice, I chuck her under the chin. It isn't immorality, it's only a habit. Well, I took my stick and set off for the sands. No, it won't do to set off yet. I'm sorry again to detain you, but you really must hear the story of the sands and the story of Rosanna, for this reason, that the matter of the diamond touches them both nearly. How hard I try to get on with my statement without stopping by the way, and how badly I succeed. But there, persons and things do turn up so vexatiously in this life, and will, in a manner, insist on being noticed. Let us take it easy, and let us take it short. We shall be in the thick of this mystery soon, I promise you. Rosanna, to put the person before the thing, which is but common politeness, was the only new servant in our house. About four months before the time I am writing of, my lady had been in London, and had gone over a reformatory, intended to save forlorn women from drifting back into bad ways after they had got released from prison. The matron, seeing my lady took an interest in the place, pointed out a girl to her named Rosanna Spearman, and told her a most miserable story which I haven't the heart to repeat here, for I don't like to be made wretched without any cause, and no more do you. The upshot of it was that Rosanna Spearman had been a thief, and, not being of the sort that get up companies in the city and rob from thousands, instead of only robbing from one, the law laid hold of her, and the prison and the reformatory followed the lead of the law. The matron's opinion of Rosanna was, in spite of what she had done, that the girl was one in a thousand, and that she only wanted a chance to prove herself worthy of any Christian woman's interest in her. My lady, being a Christian woman if ever there was one yet, said to the matron upon that, Rosanna Spearman shall have her chance in my service. A week afterwards Rosanna Spearman entered the establishment as our second housemaid. Not a soul was told the girl's story, excepting Miss Rachel and me. My lady, doing me the honour to consult me about most things, consulted me about Rosanna. Having fallen a good deal latterly into the late Sir John's way of always agreeing with my lady, I agreed with her heartily about Rosanna Spearman. A fairer chance no girl could have had than was given to this poor girl of ours. None of the servants could cast her past life in her teeth, 
for none of the servants knew what it had been. She had her wages and her privileges, like the rest of them, and every now and then a friendly word from my lady in private to encourage her. In return, she showed herself, I am bound to say, well worthy of the kind treatment bestowed upon her. Though far from strong, and troubled occasionally with those fainting fits already mentioned, she went about her work modestly and uncomplainingly, doing it carefully and doing it well. But, somehow, she failed to make friends among the other women servants, excepting my daughter Penelope, who was always kind to Rosanna, although never intimate with her. I hardly know what the girl did to offend them. There was certainly no beauty about her to make the others envious. She was the plainest woman in the house, with the additional misfortune of having one shoulder bigger than the other. What the servants chiefly resented, I think, was her silent tongue and her solitary ways. She read or worked in leisure hours when the rest gossiped, and when it came to her turn to go out, nine times out of ten she quietly put on her bonnet and had her turn by herself. She never quarrelled, never took offence. She only kept a certain distance, obstinately and civilly, between the rest of them and herself. Add to this that, plain as she was, there was just a dash of something that wasn't like a housemaid, and that was like a lady, about her. It might have been in her voice, or it might have been in her face. All I can say is that the other women pounced on it like lightning the first day she came into the house, and said, which was most unjust, that Rosanna Spearman gave herself airs. Having now told the story of Rosanna, I have only to notice one of the many queer ways of this strange girl, to get on next to the story of the Sands. Our house is high up on the Yorkshire coast, close by the sea. We have got beautiful walks all around us in every direction but one. That one I acknowledge to be a horrid walk. It leads for a quarter of a mile through a melancholy plantation of firs, and brings you out between low cliffs on the loneliest and ugliest little bay on all our coast. The sand hills here run down to the sea, and end in two spits of rock jutting out opposite each other, until you lose sight of them in the water. One is called the North Spit, and one the South. Between the two, shifting backwards and forwards at certain seasons of the year, lies the most horrible quicksand on the shores of Yorkshire. At the turn of the tide, Something goes on in the unknown deeps below, which sets the whole face of the quicksand shivering and trembling in a manner most remarkable to see, and which has given it, among the people in our parts, the name of the Shivering Sand. A great bank, half a mile out, nigh the mouth of the bay, breaks the force of the main ocean coming in from the offing. Winter and summer, when the tide flows over the quicksand, the sea seems to leave the waves behind it on the bank, and rolls its waters in smoothly with a heave, and covers the sand in silence. A lonesome and a horrid retreat, I can tell you. No boat ever ventures into this bay. No children from the fishing village, called Cobb's Hole, ever come here to play. The very birds of the air, as it seems to me, give the shivering sand a wide berth. That a young woman, with dozens of nice walks to choose from, and company to go with her, if she only said, Come, should prefer this place, and should sit and work or read in it, all alone, when it's her turn out, I grant you passes belief. It's true, nevertheless, account for it as you may, that this was Rosanna Spearman's favourite walk, except when she went once or twice to Cobb's Hole to see the only friend she had in all our neighbourhood, of whom more anon. It's also true that I was now setting out for this same place to fetch the girl in for dinner, which brings us round happily to our former point, and starts us fair again on our way to the sands. I saw no sign of the girl in the plantation. When I got out through the sand hills onto the beach, there she was all alone, looking out on the quicksand and the sea. 
She started when I came up with her, and turned her head away from me. Not looking me in the face, being another of the proceedings which, as head of the servants, I never allow on principle to pass without inquiry, I turned her round my way, and saw that she was crying. My bandana handkerchief, one of six beauties given to me by my lady, was handy in my pocket. I took it out and said to Rosanna, Come and sit down, my dear, on the slope of the beach along with me. I'll dry your eyes for you first, and then I'll make so bold as to ask what you have been crying about. When you come to my age, you'll find sitting down on the slope of a beach a much longer job than you think it now. By the time I was settled, Rosanna had dried her own eyes with a very inferior handkerchief to mine, cheap cambric. She looked very quiet and very wretched, but she sat down by me like a good girl when I told her. When you want to comfort a woman by the shortest way, take her on your knee. I thought of this golden rule, but there, Rosanna wasn't Nancy, and that's the truth of it. Now tell me, my dear, I said, what are you crying about? About the years that are gone, Mr. Betteridge, says Rosanna, quietly. My past life still comes back to me sometimes. Come, come, my girl, I said. Your past life is all sponged out. Why can't you forget it? She took by one of the lappets of my coat. I am a slovenly old man, and a good deal of my meat and drink gets splashed about on my clothes. Sometimes one of the women, and sometimes another, cleans me of my grease. The day before, Rosanna had taken out a spot for me on the lappet of my coat, with a new composition warranted to remove anything. The grease was gone, but there was a little dull place left on the nap of the cloth where the grease had been. The girl pointed to that place and shook her head. The stain is taken off, she said, but the place shows, Mr. Betteridge, the place shows. A remark which takes a man unawares by means of his own coat is not an easy remark to answer. Something in the girl herself, too, made me particularly sorry for her just then. She had nice brown eyes, plain as she was in other ways, and she looked at me with a sort of respect for my happy old age and my good character, as things for ever out of her own reach, which made my heart heavy for us, our second housemaid. Not feeling myself able to comfort her, there was only one other thing to do, and that thing was to take her in to dinner. Help me up, I said. You are late for dinner, Rosanna, and I have come to fetch you in. You, Mr. Betteridge, says she. They told Nancy to fetch you, I said, but I thought you might like your scolding better, my dear, if it came from me. Instead of helping me up, the poor thing stole her hand into mine and gave it a little squeeze. She tried hard to keep from crying again, and succeeded, for which I respected her. "'You're very kind, Mr. Betteridge,' she said. "'I don't want any dinner today. Let me bide a little longer here.' "'What makes you like to be here?' I asked. "'What is it that brings you everlastingly to this miserable place?' "'Something draws me to it,' says the girl, making images with her finger in the sand. I try to keep away from it, and I can't. Sometimes, says she in a low voice, as if she was frightened at her own fancy, sometimes, Mr. Betteridge, I think my grave is waiting for me here. There's roast mutton and suet pudding waiting for you, says I. Go in to dinner directly. This is what comes, Rosanna, of thinking on an empty stomach. I spoke severely, being naturally indignant at my time of life, to hear a young woman of five-and-twenty talking about her latter end. She didn't seem to hear me. She put her hand on my shoulder and kept me where I was, sitting by her side. "'I think the place has laid a spell on me,' she said. "'I dream of it night after night. I think of it when I sit stitching at my work. You know I am grateful, Mr. Betteridge. You know I try to deserve your kindness and my lady's confidence in me. But I wonder sometimes whether the life here is too quiet and too good for a woman such as I am, after all I have gone through, Mr. Betteridge. After all I have gone through. It's more lonely to me to be among the other servants, knowing that I am not what they are, 
than it is to be here. My lady doesn't know, the matron at the reformatory doesn't know, what a dreadful reproach honest people are in themselves to a woman like me. Don't scold me, there's a dear good man. I do my work, don't I? Please not to tell my lady I am discontented. I am not. My mind's unquiet sometimes, that's all. She snatched her hand off my shoulder and suddenly pointed down to the quicksand. Look, she said, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it terrible? I have seen it dozens of times, and it's always as new to me as if I had never seen it before. I looked to where she pointed. The tide was on the turn, and the horrid sand began to shiver. The broad brown face of it heaved slowly, and then dimpled and quivered all over. Do you know what it looks like to me? says Rosanna, catching me by the shoulder again. It looks as if it had hundreds of suffocating people under it, all struggling to get to the surface, all sinking lower and lower into the dreadful deeps. Throw a stone in, Mr. Betteridge, throw a stone in and let's see the sand suck it down. Here was unwholesome talk, here was an empty stomach feeding an unquiet mind. My answer, a pretty sharp one in the girl's own interests, I promise you, was at my tongue's end when it was snapped off short, on a sudden, by a voice among the sand hills, shouting for me by name. Betteridge, cries the voice, where are you? Here, I shouted out in return, without a notion in my mind of who it was. Rosanna started to her feet and stood looking towards the voice. I was just thinking of getting on my own legs next, when I was staggered by a sudden change in the girl's face. Her complexion turned of a beautiful red, which I had never seen in it before. She brightened all over with a kind of speechless and breathless surprise. "'Who is it?' I asked. Rosanna gave me back my own question. "'Oh, who is it?' she said softly, more to herself than to me. I twisted round on the sand and looked behind me. There, coming out on us from among the hills, was a bright-eyed young gentleman, dressed in a beautiful fawn-coloured suit, with gloves and hat to match, with a rose in his buttonhole, and a smile on his face that might have set the shivering sand itself smiling at him in return. Before I could get on my legs, he plumped down on the sand by the side of me, put his arm around my neck, foreign fashion, and gave me a hug that fairly squeezed the breath out of my body. "'Dear old Betteridge,' says he, "'I owe you seven and sixpence. Now do you know who I am?' "'Lord bless and save us. Here, four good hours before we expected him, was Mr. Franklin Blake.' Before I could say a word, I saw Mr. Franklin, a little surprised to all appearance, look up from me to Rosanna. Following his lead, I looked at the girl, too. She was blushing of a deeper red than ever, seemingly at having caught Mr. Franklin's eye and she turned and left us suddenly, in a confusion quite unaccountable to my mind, without either making her curtsy to the gentleman or saying a word to me, very unlike her, her usual self, a civiler and better behaved servant in general you never met with. "'That's an odd girl,' said Mr. Franklin. "'I wonder what she sees in me to surprise her.' "'I suppose, sir,' I answered, drolling on a young gentleman's continental education. It's the varnish from foreign parts. I set down here Mr. Franklin's careless question and my foolish answer, as a consolation and encouragement to all stupid people, it being, as I have remarked, a great satisfaction to our inferior fellow creatures to find their betters are, on occasions, no brighter than they are. Neither Mr. Franklin, with his wonderful foreign training, nor I, with my age, experience, and natural mother wit, had the ghost of an idea what Rosanna Spearman's unaccountable behaviour really meant. She was out of our thoughts, poor soul, before we had seen the last flutter of her little grey cloak among the sand hills. And what of that, you will ask? Naturally enough. Read on, good friend, as patiently as you can, and perhaps you will be as sorry for Rosanna Spearman as I was when I found out the truth. End of chapter 4「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moonstone 
by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 5 The first thing I did, after we were left alone together, was to make a third attempt to get up from my seat on the sand. Mr. Franklin stopped me. There is one advantage about this horrid place, he said. We have got it all to ourselves. Stay where you are, Betteridge. I have something to say to you. While he was speaking, I was looking at him, trying to see something of the boy I remembered in the man before me. The man put me out. Look as I might, I could see no more of his boy's rosy cheeks than of his boy's trim little jacket. His complexion had got pale. His face, at the lower part, was covered, to my great surprise and disappointment, with a curly brown beard and moustachios. He had a lively, touch-and-go way with him, very pleasant and engaging, I admit, but nothing to compare with his free and easy manners of other times. To make matters worse, he had promised to be tall, and had not kept his promise. He was neat and slim and well-made, but he wasn't by an inch or two up to the middle height. In short, he baffled me altogether. The years that had passed had left nothing of his old self, except the bright, straightforward look in his eyes. There I found our nice boy again, and there I concluded to stop in my investigation. "'Welcome back to the old place, Mr. Franklin,' I said. "'And the more welcome, sir, that you have come some hours before we expected you.' "'I have a reason for coming before you expected me,' answered Mr. Franklin. I suspect, Betteridge, that I have been followed and watched in London for the last three or four days, and I have travelled by the morning instead of the afternoon train, because I wanted to give certain dark-looking stranger the slip. These words did more than surprise me. They brought back to my mind, in a flash, the three jugglers, and Penelope's notion that they meant some mischief to Mr. Franklin Blake. "'Who's watching you, sir, and why?' I inquired. "'Tell me about the three Indians that you've had at the house today,' said Mr. Franklin, without noticing my question. "'It's just possible, Betteridge, that my stranger and your three jugglers may turn out to be pieces of the same puzzle.' "'How do you come to know about the jugglers, sir?' I asked, putting one question on top of another, which is bad manners, I own. "'But you don't expect much from poor human nature, so don't expect much from me.' "'I saw Penelope at the house,' says Mr. Franklin.' And Penelope told me, Your daughter promised to be a pretty girl in Betteridge, and she's kept her promise. Penelope has got a small ear and a small foot. Did the late Mrs. Betteridge possess these inestimable advantages? The late Mrs. Betteridge possessed a good many defects, sir, says I. One of them, if you'll pardon my mentioning it, was never keeping to the matter in hand. She was more like a fly than a woman. She wouldn't settle on anything. She would just have suited me, says Mr. Franklin. I never settle on anything either. Betteridge, your edge is better than ever. Your daughter said as much when I asked for particulars about the jugglers. Father will tell you, sir, he's a wonderful man for his age, and he expresses himself beautifully. Penelope's own words, blushing divinely. Not even my respect for you prevented me from... Well, never mind. I knew her when she was a child, and she's none the worse for it. Let's be serious. What did the jugglers do? I was something dissatisfied with my daughter, not for letting Mr. Franklin kiss her, Mr. Franklin was welcome to that, but for forcing me to tell her foolish story at second hand. However, there was no help for it now but to mention the circumstances. Mr. Franklin's merriment all died away as I went on. He sat knitting his eyebrows and twisting his beard. When I had done, he repeated after me two of the questions which the chief juggler had put to the boy seemingly for the purpose of fixing them well in his mind. Is it on this road, and on no other, that the English gentleman will travel today? Has the English gentleman got it about him? I suspect, says Mr. Franklin, pulling a little sealed paper parcel out of his pocket, that it means this, and this, Betteridge, means my uncle Herncastle's famous diamond. Good Lord, sir, I broke out. How do you come to be in charge of the Wicked Colonel's diamond? The Wicked Colonel has left his diamond as a birthday present to my cousin Rachel, says Mr. Franklin. And my father, as the Wicked Colonel's executor, has given it in charge to me to bring down here. If the sea, then oozing in smoothly over the shivering sand, had been changed into dry land before my own eyes, 
I doubt if I could have been more surprised than I was when Mr. Franklin spoke those words. "'The Colonel's diamond left to Miss Rachel,' says I. "'And your father, sir, the Colonel's executor?' "'Why, I would have laid any bet you like, Mr. Franklin, "'that your father wouldn't have touched the Colonel with a pair of tongs.' "'Strong language, Betteridge. "'What was there against the Colonel? "'He belonged to your time, not to mine. "'Tell me what you know about him, "'and I'll tell you how my father came to be his executor, "'and more besides. "'I have made some discoveries in London "'about my Uncle Herncastle and his diamond, "'which have a rather ugly look to my eyes, "'and I want you to confirm them. "'You called him the Wicked Colonel just now. "'Search your memory, my old friend, and tell me why.' I saw he was in earnest, and I told him. Here follows the substance of what I said, written out entirely for your benefit. Pay attention to it, or you'll be all abroad when we get deeper into the story. Clear your mind of the children, or the dinner, or the new bonnet, or what not. Try, if you can't, forget politics, horses, prices in the city, and grievances at the club. I hope you won't take this freedom on my part amiss. It's only a way I have of appealing to the gentle reader. Lord, haven't I seen you with the greatest authors in your hands? And don't I know how ready your attention is to wander when it's a book that asks for it, instead of a person? I spoke a little way back of my lady's father, the old lord with the short temper and the long tongue. He had five children in all, two sons to begin with, then, after a long time, his wife broke out breeding again, and the three young ladies came briskly one after the other, as fast as the nature of things would permit. My mistress, as before mentioned, being the youngest and best of the three. Of the two sons, the eldest, Arthur, inherited the title and the estates. The second, the Honourable John, got a fine fortune left for him by a relative and went into the army. It's an ill bird, they say, that fouls its own nest. I look on the noble family of the Herncastles as being my nest, and I shall take it as a favour if I am not expected to enter in, into particulars on the subject of the Honourable John. He was, I honestly believe, one of the greatest blackguards that ever lived. I can hardly say more or less for him than that. He went into the army, beginning in the guards. He had to leave the guard before he was two and twenty, but never mind why. They are very strict in the army, and they were too strict for the Honourable John. He went out to India to see whether they were equally strict there, and to try a little active service. In the matter of bravery, to give him his due, he was a mixture of bulldog and gamecock, with a dash of the savage. He was at the taking of Seringatapam. Shortly afterwards he changed into another regiment, and, in the course of time, changed into a third. In the third he got his last step as lieutenant-colonel, and getting that, got also a sunstroke, and came home to England. He came back with a character that closed the doors of all his family against him. My lady, just then married, taking the lead and declaring, with Sir John's approval, of course, that her brother should never enter any house of hers. There was more than one slur on the colonel that made people shy of him, but the blot of the diamond is all I need to mention here. It was said that he had got possession of his Indian jewel by means which, bold as he was, he didn't dare acknowledge. He never attempted to sell it, not being in need of money, and not, to give him his due again, making money an object. He never gave it away, he never even showed it to any living soul. Some said he was afraid of its getting him into a difficulty with the military authorities. Others, very ignorant indeed of the real nature of the man, said that he was afraid, if he showed it, of its costing him his life. There was, perhaps, a grain of truth mixed up with this last report. It was false to say that he was afraid, but it was a fact that his life had been twice threatened in India, and it was firmly believed that the moonstone was at the bottom of it. When he came back to England and found himself avoided by everybody, the moonstone was thought to be at the bottom of it again. The mystery of the Colonel's life got in the Colonel's way, and outlawed him, as you may say, among his own people. The men wouldn't let him into their clubs, the women, more than one, whom he wanted to marry, refused him. Friends and relations got too near-sighted to see him in the street. Some men in this mess would have tried to set themselves right with the world, 
but to give in, even when he was wrong, and had all society against him, was not the way of the Honourable John. He had kept the diamond in flat defiance of assassination in India. He kept the diamond in flat defiance of public opinion in England. There you have the portrait of the man before you, as in a picture, a character that braved everything, and a face, handsome as it was, that looked possessed by the devil. We heard different rumours about him from time to time. Sometimes they said he was given up to smoking opium and collecting old books. Sometimes he was reported to be trying strange things in chemistry. Sometimes he was seen carousing and amusing himself among the lowest people in the lowest slums of London. Anyhow, a solitary, vicious, underground life was the life that the Colonel led. Once, and once only, after his return to England, I saw him myself, face to face. About two years before the time of which I am now writing, and about a year and a half before the time of his death, the Colonel came unexpectedly to my lady's house in London. It was the night of Miss Rachel's birthday, the 21st of June, and there was a party in honour of it, as usual. I received a message from the footman to say that a gentleman wanted to see me. Going up into the hall, there I found the Colonel, wasted and worn and old and shabby, and as wild and wicked as ever. "'Go up to my sister,' says he, "'and say that I have called to wish my niece many happy returns of the day.' He had made attempts by letter, more than once already, to be reconciled with my lady, for no other purpose I am firmly persuaded than to annoy her. But this was the first time he had actually come to the house. I had it on the tip of my tongue to say that my mistress had a party that night, but the devilish look of him daunted me. I went upstairs with his message, and left him, by his own desire, waiting in the hall. The servants stood staring at him at a distance, as if he was a walking engine of destruction, loaded with powder and shot, and likely to go off among them at a moment's notice. My lady had a dash, no more, of the family temper. Tell Colonel Herncastle, she said, when I gave her her brother's message, that Miss Verinder is engaged and that I decline to see him. I tried to plead for a civiler answer than that, knowing the Colonel's constitutional superiority to the restraints which govern gentlemen in general. Quite useless. The family temper flashed out at me directly. When I want your advice, says my lady, you know that I always ask for it. I don't ask for it now. I went downstairs with the message, of which I took the liberty of presenting a new and amended version of my own contriving, as follows. My lady and Miss Rachel regret that they are engaged, Colonel, and beg to be excused having the honour of seeing you. I expected him to break out, even at that polite way of putting it. To my great surprise, he did nothing of the sort. He alarmed me by taking the thing with an unnatural quiet. His eyes, of a glittering bright grey, just settled on me for a moment, and he laughed, not out of himself like other people, but into himself, in a soft, chuckling, horribly mischievous way. "'Thank you, Betteridge,' he said. "'I shall remember my niece's birthday.' With that he turned on his heel and walked out of his house. The next birthday came round, and we heard he was ill in bed six months afterwards, that is to say, six months before the time I am now writing of, there came a letter from a highly respectable clergyman to my lady. It communicated two wonderful things in the way of family news. First, that the Colonel had forgiven his sister on his deathbed. Second, that he had forgiven everybody else, and had made a most edifying end. I have myself, in spite of the bishops and the clergy, an unfeigned respect for the Church, but I am firmly persuaded at the same time that the devil remained in undisturbed possession of the Honourable John, and that the last abominable act in the life of that abominable man was, saving your presence, taking the clergyman in. This was the sum total of what I had to tell Mr. Franklin. I remarked that he listened more and more eagerly the longer I went on. Also that the story of the colonel being sent away from his sister's door 
on the occasion of his niece's birthday, seemed to strike Mr. Franklin like a shot that had hit the mark. Though he didn't acknowledge it, I saw that I had made him uneasy, plainly enough in his face. "'You have had your say, Betteridge,' he remarked. "'It's my turn now. Before, however, I tell you what discoveries I have made in London, and how I came to be mixed up in this matter of the diamond, I want to know one thing. You look, my old friend, as if you didn't quite understand the object to be answered by this consultation of ours. Do your looks belie you? No, sir, I said. My looks, on this occasion at any rate, tell the truth. In that case, says Mr. Franklin, suppose I put you up to my point of view before we go any further. I see three very serious questions involved in the Colonel's birthday gift to my cousin Rachel. Follow me carefully, Betteridge, and count me off on your fingers if it will help you, says Mr. Franklin, with a certain pleasure in showing how clear-headed he could be, which reminded me wonderfully of old times when he was a boy. Question the first. Was the Colonel's diamond the object of a conspiracy in India? Question the second. Has the conspiracy followed the Colonel's diamond to England? Question the third. Did the Colonel know the conspiracy followed the diamond, and has he purposely left a legacy of trouble and danger to his sister through the innocent medium of his sister's child? That is what I am driving at, Betteridge. Don't let me frighten you. It was all very well to say that, but he had frightened me. If he was right, here was our quiet English house, suddenly invaded by a devilish Indian diamond, bringing after it a conspiracy of living rogues set loose in us by the vengeance of a dead man. There was our situation, as revealed to me in Mr. Franklin's last words. Whoever heard the like of it, in the nineteenth century mind, in an age of progress, and in a country which rejoices in the blessings of the British Constitution, nobody ever heard the like of it, and, consequently, nobody can be expected to believe it. I shall go on with my story, however, in spite of that. When you get a sudden alarm of that sort that I had got now, nine times out of ten the place you feel it is in your stomach. When you feel it in your stomach, your attention wanders and you begin to fidget. I fidgeted silently in my place, on the sand. Mr. Franklin noticed me, contending with a perturbed stomach or mind, which you please, they mean the same thing, and, checking himself just as he was starting with his part of the story, he said to me sharply, what do you want? What did I want? I didn't tell him, but I'll tell you in confidence. I wanted a whiff of my pipe and a turn at Robinson Crusoe. End of chapter 5